I think, you know, the post-it for me was kind of like an anchor. It was a, a, you know, a lighthouse at the end of a tunnel that I was driving towards. But actually, I did have to do the driving (laughs) and I had to do the work and I had to work my backside off in order to get here. Welcome to the Author Like a Boss podcast, the podcast for indie authors who want to improve their writing, up-level their marketing, make money with their books, and have fun doing it. Now, on to the show with your host, Ella Barnard. Hey, bosses. I've spent some time this last couple weeks trying to refine why I am so passionate about helping you, working with you, and what it is like, what the purpose of the podcast is like, purpose with a capital P. And I finally came up with it. It is to help women make money with their creativity, become their best selves, and ultimately transform the world. Now that's my purpose, but what it means when it comes to author like a boss is that I want to help women author like a boss. (laughs) That means helping women make six figures with their writing and in the process of doing that, become their confident, badass selves. With this in mind, there's been some crazy awesome stuff happening behind the scenes, and I'm really excited to share it with you. The best way to be notified of when all the awesomeness is going to be available is to sign up for the newsletter. To do that and to get a free copy of my ebook, Start Marketing Your Book, go to authorlikeaboss.com forward slash free book. Hello, everybody. Hello, bosses. I am here today with Sasha Black. I'm so excited. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Sasha Black has five obsessions, words, expensive shoes, conspiracy theories, self-improvement, and breaking the rules. She also has the mind of a perpetual 16-year-old with only slightly less drama and slightly more bills. Sasha writes books about people with magical powers and other books about the art of writing. She lives in Hertfordshire, Hertfordshire, England, and her wife and genius giant of a son. When she's not writing, she can be found laughing inappropriately loud, blogging, sniffing musty old books, fangirling film and TV soundtracks, or thinking up new ways to break the rules. Oh my gosh, you guys have no idea how excited I am to be chatting with her because we had a a previous interview that my software didn't record and I loved it. And now I'm like, well, I guess I get at least another chance to talk to her because I love her. (laughs) So thank you for being here. (laughs) Oh, you are so welcome. It happens. It's absolutely fine. And honestly, I'm honored to, to, that you even came back to me so that I can be on your podcast. So thank you. Oh my gosh. Are you serious? No. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yes. You guys, I really love this lady. So everybody else can get to love you like I do. Can you start with telling us a little bit about yourself and your author journey? Absolutely. So my author journey definitely started when I was a kid. I was one of these prolific readers. I kind of had to change libraries because I read so many books in the children's section. Um, But Uh, you know, I grew up knowing I needed to get a proper job and, you know, I didn't go to university and do um, an MFA or whatever, a BFA, I think they call it. Um, I went and did psychology. So, I went in um, afterwards to a, a master's in psychology and kind of decided I didn't really want to follow down that route. So I ended up in a very um, middle class, bog standard management scheme. Um, it was fun. I enjoyed it. But very quickly, I realized quite how conservative the organization I was working in was. And I didn't really fit the mold. So I needed some kind of an outlet. I would journaled a lot as a teenager. And I'd kind of stopped um, when I went to university for various reasons that don't really matter now. But I'd stopped journaling. And, you know, blogging was kind of this new thing back then. So I figured what the hey, I'm going to blog. And that's where Sasha Black comes from because I needed an anonymous name because I couldn't just sort of spurt my work rants all over the internet in my real name. Um, So I started blogging and then I met people in the community. I met other writers. I met other bloggers. I started participating in um, like flash fiction challenges and and, um, creative writing prompts and things. And I 
you know, it, it, one thing led to another and I dug out my old stories and scraps of manuscripts and notes that I'd written as a child and teenager. And I just decided that I, I you know, I wanted to write this book. A- at the same time, I kind of got pregnant and that made me realise that I wanted to be the person that um, showed their son you know, that it's okay to follow their dreams. So I, you know, I just went with it. And I'd heard about NaNoWriMo, which is the national novel writing competition where you write 50,000 words in a month. And I'd sort of spent the entire year of, well, nine months of being pregnant and sort of a few months before that, just plotting, 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 plotting to death, plotting, and not writing a bloody word. Oh, sorry. I probably shouldn't say that. Sorry, 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 everyone. You can. Oh, okay, thank God. Thank God. Yeah. (laughs) I just spent a whole year plotting and and I was just like, what am I doing? I'm not going to get any words written. Anyway, so I did NaNo and I smashed out 57 or 52,000 words, whatever it was. And it gave me the habit. And that was that was my first book, which is a young adult fantasy, um, and I threw it away because <laughs> it was terrible. It was just awful, <laughs> and uh, so I, I wrote it again, and then I threw that away as well, and and then I wrote another version uh, from scratch. Mine, so I think this I, I totaled I think two hundred and thirty seven thousand words for what ended up as like a sixty four thousand uh, word manuscript. Anyway, long story short, I started writing and that was it. I, I I had the habit and that was, well, I so I ended up publishing that book. No, I didn't because I published a different book first. But anyway, I published in 2017 at the end of May and a few weeks ago, I think three weeks ago, so a little under two years later, I quit my job to write full time. <gasps> oh my gosh. Everybody who's listening is like, what? I want that. That's what I want. Look at how excited she is. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So there's a lot that happens in between. I wrote three copies of this one book, which one you guys gives you some insight into her personality. Cause she's like, I have to write it again. Toss it, write it again. Toss it, write it again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I couldn't just edit it. To be fair, they were total train crashes. Like during that process, I was learning how to write as well. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just, you know, I wouldn't throw away a manuscript now because it would be, you know, of a good enough quality that I could edit it. Back then, I, you know, I went through these huge developmental writing curves and there was just no way <laughs> I could keep the manuscript. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody can see this. <laughs> Burn it, burn it. Never going light of day. (laughs) No, no one, no one can see this. And there's a few books that have been published that I, I wish somebody (laughs) had been like, no one should see this. But the the positive thing about those books is I'm like, every time I read a book like that, that I'm like, this is terrible. I'm like, you know what? I could do this. This is really encouraging because this person has been published. That last year, reading you know a lot of traditionally published books like that, and not that you know I've got nothing against traditionally published books, but um, you know indies often get a bad name for poor quality, you know grammar or whatever. Or we used to. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I think that's probably across the board. If I'm perfectly honest, across I the think whole so industry. too. I think so too. But I wanted to ask you more about this. Two years ago, I published a book, and now I quit my job. Okay. What happened? What yeah. everybody wants to know is how that happened okay. the in between. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How did you do that? Because I want to do that. No. Yes. Um, okay. Well, I nearly killed myself trying. So don't do that, everybody. Okay. Um, so, okay. Basically, I, I actually published nonfiction first. So I published a book, a writing book called 13 Steps to Evil, How to Craft a Super Bad Villain which, as it says on the uh, tin, it teaches you how to create better villains. That was off the back of uh, a few blog posts that I'd written that they didn't really go viral, but, you know, I had an awful lot of traffic very quickly. And after a bit of research, I I realized there wasn't an awful lot of writing craft books out there that kind of focused very specifically on creating villains. There was sort of only one or two. So I figured there was a market. People were obviously searching for this information so I was going to give it to them because villains are my favorite and I make no apologies for that. So I published 
And then I published a workbook to go with it because I'm one of these um, kind of fervent supporters of multiple streams of income. And actually, that's why I'm quitting. So completely, honestly, completely vulnerable here. You know, I am not quitting my job yet just based on sales. I am quitting my job because I have grown a company. And in that company, I have multiple streams of income. So I I do developmental editing. I do um, some VA, some you know minor VA work. I do content uh, writing and website management. I do well. I'm about to do courses, so craft, writing craft courses. So that will be another income stream. I have a Patreon. I have um, paperbacks, eBooks. I'm about to have an audio book this summer. I do consulting. Um, you know, helping authors to uh, you know create strategies and plans or whatever it is they want to do, whether it be marketing or whatever. So I have all of these pockets of income and there's, you know, no one reliance on any of them. So that's why I've quit my job because, you know, uh, the, the offers of work are now outweighing the hours at work, so to speak. You know, I've worked 80 hour weeks, I would say, probably for the last three years, and I just can't do it anymore. I'm exhausted and um, I need some balance back in my life. So, you know, you kind of get to this point in your life and it's it's kind of a crossroads. And sorry, I'm kind of blabbing here, but uh, let me bear with me as I kind of give you this She's story. She's in the middle um, of it, you guys. She's in yeah. the middle of it right now. So go ahead. I really am. Yeah. So um, I kind of spent uh, the last two or three years saying that 2019 was going to be my year. I wrote a post-it, which we talked about last time, um, in, in that I carried with me everywhere that said, um, I will be happy writing it full-time in the year 2020. And then I signed it and then I put it in my wallet and I looked at it every single day. And so, you know, I thought it would be 2020, but actually the universe listened, you know, not to be too philosophical about this, you know, and and lots of things that I'd been working on came to a culmination and a few, a few uh, came to fruition this year. So uh, the winds of change kind of, they were there in January and, and I kind of hit this crossroads where I had a choice. Either I, I took on this extra freelance work and I, you know, I, I made the leap of faith or I didn't. And realistically, I had to ask myself what I was doing, because if I wasn't going to pursue this career in writing, then why keep trying and why keep writing? So, so yeah, it was a choice and I jumped and I, I, I haven't regretted it yet. <laughs> okay. So question, the choice, just to get specific, the choice was the freelance you're putting the freelance under the writing kind of choice yeah, option so. versus so it's, yeah versus your daytime job essentially what's okay. happened is i have enough freelance work between my editing content writing va work um bits of consultancy course creation although i i kind of put that under my writing Mm-hmm. So the the freelance stuff pays my bills, and so so it kind of replaces my salary, but in half of the working time. Uh. So I I only have to do two weeks work every month to pay all of my bills and a little bit more. So why wouldn't I quit my job? Because I'm going to get two weeks every month to write, and and that two weeks. I will very rapidly be able to create enough content, enough courses, enough consultancy that I can lower the amount of freelance work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, who wouldn't go for that? Yes. Okay. There's risk. Yes. Okay. You know, it's scary, but actually if you want this, you know, you have to take it. Yeah. And you've been working what, and you had been working 80 hour weeks exactly to be able to, this is the thing. It's not like you're just like, I, I don't know if you've watched Oprah. I watched Oprah's 20th anniversary DVD a million times. She has this interview on it with Jim Carrey. Where uh-huh, he had like yes. the check. He had this check. Yeah. Of, like I'm going to make, I think it was a million dollars or something. It was some large amount like by this date. And he looked at it every day and then like, and he had it dated. Yep. And like a month before the date He's like a month before the date, Ace Ventura Pet Detective came out or something. One of these and and it w- equaled the amount that was on this check that he wrote for himself, kind of like your post-it note. Absolutely. When and he's I like you can't just sit around 
eating a sandwich, you actually do have to take action. Like visualizing by itself doesn't do anything. You have to visualize that's right and take action which you have been doing that's right absolutely that I could not agree with you more it is about action and you know I think you know the post-it for me was kind of like an anchor it was a, a you know a lighthouse at the end of a tunnel that I was driving towards but actually I did have to do the driving <laughs> and I had to do the work and I had to work my backside off in order to get here but uh you know a- anybody can do it and i and i have now written another post it it's now a financial target um oh. so i have written a new post it and i am carrying a new post it but yes oh, oh so i got i i don't know where he got it from but um if anybody's interested i read jack canfield's the success principles and that's um he, an amazing motivational book yeah i think we had talked about this last time because i was like yes i've also read that <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> like, it is a really good book. And it's, it's fun because you can just read like, it has a lot of things to try. And they're yes, each just does. a few yeah, pages. Yeah. They're each just a few pages. You can kind of almost flip through and be like, okay, let me try this next thing. Oh, and yeah, see what works for you. It's so good. Oh my gosh. So cool. Yeah. It's, I'm pretty woo woo, Sasha. So. <laughs> 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 so you, you like my winds of change and my my hippie universal oh my uh, gosh. feelings. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think everybody on this everybody who's listened to me for more than a couple episodes knows that I'm pretty woo woo <laughs> in a practical way. Like woo woo plus like real information. Yeah. So what for the people who maybe aren't moving into freelance stuff at this point, are you willing to share what percentage and or the, the, the journey of your fiction, what fiction work, and maybe a kind of general percentage about how much or, and, or how your fiction work helped support the rest. Yeah. So no one income stream is accountable for more than 40 percent so i think the the largest one is 40 percent and all others and and i i'm twitching at 40 percent i would rather it was significantly lower than that so that i either have more income streams or the income streams that i have have more of a balance so um so yeah so so that that's probably as much as i'm willing to say on on the percentages that's fine but so my nonfiction earns more than my fiction at the moment. I'm completely happy with that. I love fiction just as much as I love writing my nonfiction. So I, I would say that at the moment, fiction is quite a hard sell because uh, we're moving towards a pay to play market. So, you're, you know, you need to pay, you need to do paid advertising if you want to sell your um, fiction books. Whereas with nonfiction, it's, it's kind of a perennial seller because you are solving people's problems and people will always have those problems. So they will always be searching for the answer, which is how, um, you know, because, you know, your books are becoming their own metadata data and and so your your books essentially are going to be solving a problem and if you have you know add-on courses or consultancy or you know workbooks there then you know those those income streams add up quite rapidly i i think i've completely forgotten what you asked me (laughs) (laughs) sorry (laughs) most of my audience doesn't write nonfiction, so i was asking how i guess how your fiction and nonfiction and the way the ways all your income streams, how they support each other. Okay. Yeah. So, so at the moment, my nonfiction essentially pays for me to write my fiction. My fiction does earn just not as much as my nonfiction. My, the problem with my fiction is that I only have two books in my series. You know, really, I don't think I know of many authors, unless they're you know, romance authors who are earning good money with less than sort of five books in mm-hmm. a series because you your first book becomes a loss leader. And I am using my first book like that. So I am doing mailing list giveaways. I am doing um, freebie periods. I am doing uh, 99 book bub deals or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, I am now, I have a second book in the series. I'm starting to see the sale through. So, 
you know, once I've got three, four or five, six books in that series, actually my earning power will be significantly more. And that is one of the reasons I quit my job because mm-hmm. I cannot write fast enough. Um, in You know, I'm a mum, I have a five-year-old, I, I'm a, a wife, I have a house to run, you know, I, as well as a full-time job, as well as a writing business. So, mm-hmm. you know, one of the reasons I'm quitting is because I want to dedicate more time to writing my fiction faster. You know, you know, and, th- and my problem is I'm greedy and I get... Sh- you know, bloody magpie, shiny object syndrome. And, you know, I've got these two other series that I've kind of half started. And I'm like, no, Sasha, just concentrate on finishing the one first. Um, you know, <laughs> so, um, yes. So that is one of, you know, I am doing this because um, my fiction has lots of potential mm-hmm. because my read through rates are very high. So I know that the books are, um, you know, people like them. I have quite high reviews. I get good feedback. Um, the only problem I have is I don't have enough books in the series and um, visibility. But, you know, that's every indie author's problem. I love it because I think I love, like, I love that it's not, a. it's definitely not been this get rich quick kind of, oh, it's just going to happen thing. You're like, you're planning for the long run. Absolutely. With, you're like, okay, in order to focus on my fiction, which is still the, the, the intention, all mm-hmm. these things have to get into place first. And, and by working on them and creating them, that is still, you know, even though it's not writing fiction, literally, <laughs> it still mm-hmm. is moving you closer to that goal. Well, right. You know, if somebody wants a brand new Mercedes or a BMW, what do they have to do? They have to work their ass off on Mm -hmm. other things in order to pay for it. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to also move into because you were saying, you know, people like your books. And I know last time we talked about, you know, we've talked a little bit about this villain, the books about crafting a good villain. And I Mm -hmm. know that you had a I can't remember. I can't remember. Heroes. Yeah, the heroes. But then also you were saying something that you went through various books. This is from the previous podcast, you guys, but I really loved it. (laughs) And and so I'm like bringing it back up because you would would go through books and find. Ah, yes. yes. Please talk about that. Okay. So um, one of the reasons, one one of the other than ranting on my blog, the other (laughs) reason um, I started blogging is because I am senile. And basically (laughs) I I was, no, honestly, my memory is so poor. Um, I have to write everything down. Um, Anyway, uh, so I have this method of learning um, to develop my craft and I wanted a place to write these lessons down, which was my blog. And the lessons that I was learning, um, I essentially stopped losing myself in fantasy. Now, I don't mean that in a bad way in that I all of a sudden didn't enjoy reading. I love reading, you guys. I'm sure you all do too. But I would read consciously. Now, by that, I mean, I wouldn't skim read. I'd read every single word, albeit, you know, relatively quickly. And I would stop every time I saw a good piece of dialogue or perhaps a piece of character development or perhaps a description um, that jumped out, you know, a metaphor or a simile or perhaps some foreshadowing or something that I thought was foreshadowing. And what I would do is take a pencil now, nobody shoot me, don't send me emails, I know this is sacrilege, but I would um, underline very lightly <laughs> in pencil um, and stick a sticky tab uh, into the book. Now, I would get to the end of these books and sometimes I might only have three post-its and sometimes I might have 333 post-its, but I would go back and I would review all of the post, all of the underlinings and all of the post-its and I'd look for patterns. So, um, for example, The Hazelwood by Melissa uh, Albert, I think is her surname, is descriptively beautiful. It's, it's so descriptively beautiful. It's almost overindulgent, but I loved it. Um, and she has these kind of quirky characters that she has an ability to describe the characters in a way that I have just never experienced before. So I went through those notes and I would write them up into kind of themes. So the thing, the patterns that I was noticing down to kind of sentence level, um, I would write them down and I would look at how she was constructing those characters or how she was constructing those sentences. And, and then I would write up what I learned from it. And that kind of then flowed into my own writing with, you know, 
I'm not saying, I, you know, this isn't about plagiarism. This is about taking the lessons, you know, the, the, the rhythms and the beats and the, the, the verbs and the descriptions and learning how you can combine that with your own voice. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how I kind of learn. And I still do that even to this day. And it's on the blog? So it or the was lessons on, are my, on the blog. Oh, the lessons. No, so the lessons were on, are on the blog. Everything that I did historically is on the blog. Okay. I took a break for the for the last year because I was concentrating on getting books done. Mm-hmm. However, when I quit, well, I know I have quit. So when I start full time uh, on May the first, I'm going right back to blogging. Okay. So from May the first, you will see new lessons going on there uh, constantly. But everything that I have done historically is on there. I would love when you have some free time (laughs) (laughs) if you turned those blog posts into a book well funnily enough yes um the next book that i'm working on uh non-fiction book so i'm just finishing the third book in my fiction series at the moment but once that's done the next non-fiction book is and i don't this is kind of a working title but it's basically anatomy of a sentence or anatomy of prose i don't quite know Mm. um what it is but i'm basically going down to look at the nitty-gritty of sentences and i do not mean grammar here and i do not mean punctuation i mean how do you convey um you know fear in a sentence you know how do you get your character to betray that at the sentence level so that you know you create this full feeling in a reader and kind of get them to you know evoke the same feelings of it so um yeah i don't really obviously i clearly don't have a pitch quite down there but you know it's it's the next book is about my obsessive love for the sentence you know the sentence level um nuances of of voice basically i think that's going to be so so <laughs> successful just because oh, <laughs> i mean i please let me know when that comes out so i can promote it everywhere and buy it myself <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> because i'm like oh man that's so good because i've been starting since since we chatted i've been not doing it at the official level but when i like not as as deliberately as you but i've mm-hmm. definitely been like ooh, like noticing where i hadn't noticed before where i would just read through it and be like oh that feels good like oh that feels yeah. good in my tummy you know but yeah, and then yeah, I'm yeah. like, oh why does that feel good in my tummy yes. because that's beautiful <laughs> you know? right exactly so, and you will be learning from that subconsciously you mm-hmm. will be learning and it will be developing your writing yeah and now i'm highlighting things and my e-reader and yes yes and yeah yeah it's, and I especially notice with with people who are able to write funny because it yeah. is not easy to write humor. No, it's, not. it's not. And I'm like, this is something that they have to do really deliberately. And it's magic. <laughs> Yeah, I totally do agree. <laughs> I, read a, I, I read a book um, a few months ago that literally had me crying with laughter. Um, I'm just, I think it was called The Exact Opposite of OK by Laura Stephen. Mm-hmm. It was hilarious. And I just I just don't know how they do it. I just yeah. I just don't know how they do it. It's, yeah. it's an enigma. I know. So someday, someday, maybe we yeah. could do one of those together and be like, OK, yeah. these are our funny books. <laughs> But you have a book about villains. So let's talk a little bit about supervillains and some of our favorite supervillains and how you can make how and why villains are so important to stories. So let's start there. Okay. Uh, With my favorite or with her how and why? How and why? Okay, so so oh, there are <laughs> there is a whole book on this. <laughs> How do I condense this? Condense this? Okay, um, so there are a few things that I can suggest high level that you should do. So the first one would be to not have an all powerful, world ending villain with a suicide mission for the Earth, because not everybody uh, is is evil in their core. And yes, somebody's going to be frowning at the podcast going, but what about this villain? Or, you know, what about Voldemort? Yes, okay, everybody, I get it. There are some villains that are, you know, uh, truly evil at their core, would just want to end things. But, you know, readers come to books for escapism, and we learn things from 
characters and they are a reflection of humanity and if you want your readers to um to relate and uh, not necessarily empathize with but connect to your villain then you need to give them an element of humanity so it doesn't matter whether you're giving them a positive characteristic or if you're giving them um uh, something to love you know whether it you know like Voldemort had his uh, pet snake Nagini and somebody did challenge me on this and say yes but you know he was only uh, kind to Nagini because uh, she was helping him with his cause and okay yes fine but it still showed some level of uh, kindness and humanity so give your villains a a positive something that makes them uh, you know gives them that extra layer of depth now, um, just flipping back to answer the first question, which is why are they important? Mm-hmm. Um, they're important because story is change. At, at its core, um, all stories are about some kind of change, whether it be your hero's positive character arc or their negative character arc, or they don't have a character arc, but the world around them changes. For example, in The Hunger Games, they're kind of this dystopian world ending you know beat the 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 capital something has to change in your story and to create change you need a driving force and that driving force is conflict and you get conflict from your villain who opposes your hero and that is why villains are so important one other thing that i would add to how do you kind of make your villains uh what's the word <laughs> what are words right now um <laughs> uh, it's one of the two other things actually to make your villain um you know give them that rounded depth the first one is your hero is an em- embodiment of your book's theme so your villain needs to be the embodiment of the book's anti-theme and a really great example of that is Katniss from the Hunger Games and President Snow Katniss embodies sacrifice she sacrifices herself over and over again for everybody else in the story whereas President Snow sacrifices other people for his gain so they are quite literally a reversal of each other so that's one thing and the other thing is that everybody likes to talk about the wound that the hero has um you know something from their past that gives them this flaw but then everybody forgets the villain and and your villains need to have a flaw as well um flaw what am i talking about of course they're flawed they need to have a wound um something that is driving this um you know bad behavior um and it needs to be from their past and it needs to be connected to the story because there's no point having something random Random that happened to them in the past <laughs> make it relevant to the story and if you can make it relevant to the theme as well so yeah they would be my top tips oh my gosh okay so and you gave us some examples of heroes katniss and voldemort on the one what are some of your favorite villains and how do they utilize what you're talking about if you can give us yeah okay um oh that's so hard that's like asking a musician what did, we talk about, piece of music is. <laughs> did you like um do you watch once upon a time yes yes okay. Stiltskin. amazing or regina or even regina. with her redemption arc yeah yes. so i if i'm being honest i probably don't have a favorite villain which sounds ridiculous given that i am like the villain queen but the, but the reason is because i have lots of things that i like in lots of different villains so mm-hmm. for example agent smith from the matrix has one of the best villain monologues i have ever experienced in my life so he has this scene where morpheus is kind of tied up and it's raining and he's handcuffed and he's going to die and blah 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 and um agent smith talks about how humanity is this plague upon the earth Mm -hmm. and basically i always think that if if you uh, 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 if your villain can convince a reader, even if it's only for like a split second, that they're crazy, their kind of crazy idea is right, you've won. You have won as an author. And for a split second, Agent Smith had me. So um, I, I, that's why I love him. He will, he has got a place in my memory because of the first time I watched that film. And I just, I think my 15 year old mind just blew to pieces. Um, so that's one. 
I like we said I already yeah I loved Regina from Once Upon a Time's Redemption arc I just thought it was fantastic uh Hannibal Lecter because oh my god classic villain um uh, he, he uh, what I love about him is the representation of the soft side because Hannibal Lecter is a cannibal. He is pure evil, and yet he helps Clarice Starling. Um, and so that is a really good example of how actually you can still retain this core of evil. And they haven't really changed by the end of the story. They they are still a serial killer. They still eat people, and yet he's still shown kind actions by helping Clarice. So that's why I like him. Ooh, it almost makes him even more evil. Doesn't it? I know. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's interesting to think of because I think when people are writing a villain and they keep them just like, Oh, they're 100% evil, you know, like they're pure evil, but actually them, having that little bit of kindness or having that little bit of other thing and still choosing to be evil almost makes them more evil it does absolutely <sighs> there's a i think there's a i think i write about this in in the villain's book but it comes down to giving your villain a value something that they hold very dear and and when they adhere to that no matter what it means they have integrity and a villain with integrity is terrifying and that's why you find Hannibal Lecter scary Mm, because it's always a choice and their integrity so they always have a choice whether just like a hero has a choice whether to be the hero or not the villain always has a choice whether to be villainous or not it's not just and they keep having integrity and choosing to to do the the wrong thing or in or, Hannibal's case the right thing for yes. Clarice uh, he's, going back, he's going to continue to be evil and he knows that and that's why it's scary yes <laughs> yeah because it's not the wrong it's the wrong choice maybe from the I don't know yeah it's not wrong and right Ooh, that makes it so much better so much more <laughs> complex because it isn't exactly. wrong or right it's just the the integrity with their choice that could be he he still has integrity about being about eating people <laughs> yeah yeah but he he also values um you know being a gentleman and having manners which is why so basically uh, one of the other vi- the prisoners throws sorry everybody but the, 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 another prisoner throws sperm on Clarice and that's what drives Hannibal to help her because he can't abide that inmate because he thinks he's disgusting and rude and Clarice didn't deserve it so yeah that's, oh, that's... so creepy oh my mm-hmm. gosh I hope everybody's creative juices are going like Ooh, what can <laughs> I do with my villains and then I hope you can are you doing um have you done an audiobook of this? Because you actually have like a pretty good, if you wanted to, villainous voice, I think. <laughs> uh, you, funny you should say that to everybody. Um, uh, funny you everybody. should say that yeah. to everybody. <laughs> yeah. uh, I am actually recording my audiobook as we speak. Well, not <gasps> as we speak, because I'm speaking to you. Right. But um, no, yes. So I am recording villains. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's so exciting. Okay. Mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about that <laughs> R- recording oh my yeah. gosh um, yeah. okay so the reason that I'm recording is because I used to do voiceover work as a teenager so it, I kind of thought it would be like riding a bike it has been quite so much like riding a bike <laughs> but but almost like riding a bike so I kind of threw away the first few hours that I did of recording um and now we're in kind of a second phase of recording um and I think it will get finished up at the end of May um it's really exhausting actually you'd be surprised um how tiring re- recording an audiobook can be because it's not just reading you have to kind of as as the author I know what I meant when I wrote particular phrases and particular sentences but as a reader you know my book is no longer mine it's yours and you can interpret that however you feel so as 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 the author narrating her own book I'm trying to go back into the mindset that I was in and you know you have to convey those things you can't just be monotone you have to um you know emphasize things you have to have intonation um so yeah, it's 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 been really interesting. It's really enjoyable um 
knowing that I'm creating it as well. Um, but also it's, it's really hard work and, and yeah, it's very draining doing it. I have to say. Will you be doing it again? Do you think, or you think if possible? No, I will. Okay. Yeah, no, I will. My nonfiction, I I don't think I, I'm, I'm not ready to do fiction, but my nonfiction, definitely. I think what will follow or even proceed it, I'm not quite sure with the timing is yet, but you know, I'm starting to do Facebook lives in my Facebook group. I'm starting to do, I'm planning some courses, some mini courses, not kind of these monster beast ones, but you know, sort of couple of hour workshops with some things to go with them so I am getting much more into uh audio and video and there might be a podcast in the (gasps) running not I'm not well maybe 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 maybe. maybe, there are there are some conversations that are happening but uh I can't say any more than that at the moment okay exciting (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) okay um Oh, what was my next question? There was something around audiobooks. What are you, well, let's just go with what do you think the value is of having the audiobook? I think it's where the industry is going. You know, you we've been promised this audio boom for a long time, and actually it's not really come to fruition until this year. You know, I've got a lot of friends who are saying, you know, audio is really starting to grow now. Um, You can see that just from the growth of podcasts, the amount of downloads that people um, are doing. You know, I I know that from my own experience. I I started with podcasts and now I'm listening to audiobooks, which I'd never have done if it wasn't for podcasts. So, I think the value is that you ex- you you make your work accessible to more people than just ebook readers. You know, having an audio book means that um, people who are visually impaired can listen to your book. You know, people who don't like learning by reading can listen to your audio book. You know, okay, that's on the nonfiction side, and 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 the fiction. You know, that will come those audio books. But I, the nonfiction again, I think is. Uh, well, from from friends I have who have nonfiction audiobooks, they have assured me they are selling quite well. So I'm I'm hopeful that that will be quite a um, a good additional income stream. So I think it's it's a benefit for so many different reasons. And also, oh, this is the other thing. So out of the London Book Fair, which happened a couple of weeks ago, they had a huge focus on audiobooks. And one of the things that they that kind of came out is that lots of the traditional publishers are starting to do th- their backlist in audio. Now, if a traditional publisher is doing it, mm-hmm. you really ought to be doing it because they are not the fastest people. So that tells you where the market is going. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I I agree with you, and and I think like you're talking about learning, you know, for the different types of learning, but also like, I know a lot of people who would love to read a lot and especially moms. Yeah. Specifically, they don't have time to sit and read, yeah. right? But they can <laughs> listen to a book while they're doing dishes or picking up the house or doing laundry or driving to, to pick up their kid. You know, like they can listen to a book while they're doing other things where they can't just sit and read. Absolutely. So, and I think there's been a really, a limit, a limited number of audiobooks, And I'm really excited that now it's becoming, you know, more accessible for people, including for all the people who are visually impaired or learn in a different way. Or Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I might want to follow up with you. I'm hoping I'm, I've reached out to a couple of authors recently who are on the other side, like have, have done some audiobooks at this point. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I want to reach out to them and find out, like, tell us more about the process and the results because it it is, I think the next thing and yeah. um, there's opportunities there but I don't know that much about it yet. So I'm going to. And there are so many different ways to do it. You know, not every author wants to record their own audiobook and, and complete transparency. I'm voicing the work, but I'm recording it in my friend's home studio. So I'm not going to be editing or digitally mastering it. I'm paying somebody to do that because I have neither the time nor the inclination to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and and I think the other thing that's coming is the rise of wide audiobooks, just like we've had the rise of wide ebooks because BookBub is creating this uh, chirp, I think it's called, app for uh, marketing audio. So I think we are going to see an explosion and also the rise of Find Away voices as well. I met uh, Will, who's from Find Away um, at the London Book Fair, and they're just fantastic. I'm really excited by their company. So, What is Find Away voices? It's an alternative to ACX. So they are like a, so they're like an, a, a, an aggregate distributor, a bit like in, Ingram Smart, uh, Ingram Smart? What? Spark. Ingram Spark, <laughs> yeah. Who uh, distribute your print books to like 36,000 uh, bookshops. Find Away Voices do a very similar mechanism. And I believe they also do like a matching dating service where you can find audio uh artists and things but maybe don't quote me on that okay. but part, something but to I'm look pretty into sure. yes everybody. absolutely and is it all british <laughs> no it's an american <laughs> company i think i don't even know this is why this is why i'm asking people because i'm like i need to know more you guys yeah, i think I, it's an american company <laughs> okay definitely look into that i'm very curious and the acx is the amazon that's right. Yeah. One. And and okay. so the two options there are you go exclusive. So you can either do a royalty share with an, uh, a narrator who will do all of the recording and editing for you for free, but then you do a 50-50 split on the royalties or whatever royalty share you decide to do. But then you're in an, in a contract for seven years. And honestly, the industry changes way too fast Ooh. to go into a contract for seven years. You know, seven years ago, uh, wait, what year is it? So that was 2012. Oh my we, gosh. We, we're in the boom of eBooks, mm-hmm. right? So, and look how look where we are now. Do you really want to take a risk for seven years That's a long of not time. being able to do anything? It's such a long time. Yeah, that is a very long time. I think we're still in the boom of e- eBooks. Personally, like it's such yeah, a are, young but... industry still. Like, yeah, when absolutely. you talk, when you spend a lot of space in the indie author industry and or spend a lot of time and you're like, hmm, you know, everybody's, oh, we all feel really good about ebooks. But if you actually go out into the world, most readers still aren't reading ebooks, like indie published ebooks. There's st- like, there's tons of people reading them. So I'm, I'm, I'm like, yeah, please do. But if you look at just the space in general from a really high level, there's a lot of people who are just reading traditionally published and that will, I think, soon be reading more yeah absolutely yeah so it's exciting awesome okay so you've given us so much information and and (sighs) we've like bounced all over the place but it was all good like i love the way that you you kind of like speak and you're one of those people that kind of speaks like in paragraphs you're like and this is my thesis (laughs) statement of this of this statement that i'm gonna make and then i go through it and then i end it with a conclusion (laughs) and i'm like oh man i love people who talk like that i don't (laughs) but it's well thank you i had no idea i did that so thank you i've learned something about myself (laughs) (laughs) no but, but like every little bit is full of chock full of really good info it's like oh perfect now i know that thing which is why we kind of (laughs) bounced around but like i still feel like we touched on a lot of things and got a good amount of information from them she's like very knowledgeable oh thank you yeah no thank you for being here i wanted to ask you what is your best advice for people who are maybe where you were two and a half years ago and want to be what doing what you're doing now Never, ever, ever quit. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how dark it feels, never, ever quit because you only fail if you quit. And you look at all of the people, all of the indies who are high up in the industry, they are all there because they didn't quit. Most of them didn't make their money until their ninth book or their 10th book or their 15th book. You know what? That They are 15 books down and they were still going. And then they, and then that 16th book made it, you know? So, so that would be the first thing that I, I would say, always, always fight on, no matter how bad the imposter syndrome gets, no matter how bad the doubt gets, no matter how 
strong the fear is that you'll never make it. You will, as long as you just continue. Um, what else would I say? I, I, I you know, I, I think that is the only reason I'm here is because I just, I dug deep and I carried on no matter, no matter what. And there were some dark days, believe me. <laughs> mm -hmm. but just just keep writing no matter what and learning oh god obviously keep learning that would be my second one you have to keep studying and keep uh, developing your craft because unless you can write good books as harsh as that sounds you're not going to have a career so keep studying um keep learning keep uh, developing your craft and your readers will come i promise you they will come hmm. yes because a good book is a good book Exactly. My, my um last night, I think we have it. Okay, <laughs> this is gonna be a little story. Right before, but we have a cat who like <laughs> who humps the other cats. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. okay, so he's like, and he's fixed and everything. And I'm like, what is this? Like, how he doesn't have any man parts? But he's like, he just I don't know. But he was like, we sh you should have named him Humperdink. And I was like, <laughs> I was like. I can't name him Humperdink, honey. And he's like, why not? And I'm like, Humperdink, 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 because like from The Princess Bride, which when it came out, if you haven't seen it, everybody, when it came out, it did not do super well. And actually the same with The Shawshank Redemption and the same with a number of other movies who are now, what are, that are now considered kind of classics, cult classics. They didn't do that well when they first came out, but they, the quality was good and people gradually found them. And so that's what I love about what you're saying is when you put the quality out there and you keep doing it consistently, people yep. like good stories, you know, people like that's good it. stories. And and the more stories you put out, the more space you take up in, mm -hmm. in the reading sphere and on Amazon and, you know, in the bookstores. And, and eventually you will get noticed. This is all about visibility. And the more books you have, the more visible you are. And, and, and naturally, the better your craft and your voice gets anyway. Mm -hmm. Yay. So where... Sasha, where are the be where's the best place for people to find you? And well, yeah, where's the best pe place for people to find you? Can they find your villain book and your fiction book? Is there are there multiple places for that or one place? Yeah, so I am wide because long term strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so you can find my books on any bookstore, any of your online uh, bookstores. You, my name is Sasha Black, but you you spell Sasha with a C, so S A C H A. What? S-A-C-H-A -A, rather than with an S. Um, the, the, the place that I'm probably the most interactive is Instagram. And my handle is Sasha Black Author. That's the same for Facebook. And Twitter, I think, is Sasha under, underscore Black. And then my website is www.sashablack.co.uk. And you can find uh, my author services there. And you can also find my blog and all of the free content, which will be increasing at a rapid rate of knots from May. <laughs> <laughs> I love that like, like I've quit my job and I'm just turning the like revving the motor. Like, oh, I've quit yeah. my job and it's not like I'm going to go relax at home and hang out. <laughs> She's like, I'm moving. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if everybody thought I worked hard before, mm -hmm. they've seen nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. And you have, and is the Facebook group that you mentioned, the Villainous Facebook group, is oh, that yes. also linkable from your website? Yeah, so, uh, mm, not sure. Makes note it to self. It will be. Um, <laughs> yeah, it will be. Um, <laughs> um, so it's, it's all of the normal facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash 13 S T E, which stands for steps to evil. So Ooh. 13 S T E is the, is the group. Okay. Or, or I'm sure if you search 13 steps to evil on Facebook, you'll find the group. Okay. And I do Facebook lives there and I do Q and a sessions. So authors and writers can have their marketing, publishing and craft questions answered by me on a more or less monthly basis and probably slightly more frequently going forward. <laughs> love it okay i did not know about that so i am also going to be joining oh, immediately fantastic. after this interview because <laughs> <laughs> i'm like i want to know about good villain things and i like to hang out with you so da -da -da -da, win um <sighs> thank you so much for being here 
Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's an, it's been an honor and a pleasure. I love talking to you. Oh my gosh. I love talking to you too. And everybody, I hope you've enjoyed this interview as much as I have. And I hope you had got as much good information. As always, you can see the show notes at authorlikeaboss.com. Hugs and happy authoring here at Author Like a Boss. If you love the Author Like a Boss podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes. Until next time.